we actually have a guest that's going to be speaking in a few minutes. Can you bring me that water right there? Because nobody likes a dry preacher. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, we have a guest that's going to be talking in a few minutes via video. So you don't want to miss that. That's coming up. And, uh, you know, it's odd. You know, I thought, wow, I'm preaching on hell and it's Mother's Day. Well, let me give you my other slant on this. Now, this is December of 1975. I was 17 years of age, and I was dating the wrong girl. I won't even go any further than that. But in my mother, uh, December, I came in one day, and, uh, you know, Mama just had a way of talking. You just kind of got what she was saying, you know. And uh, so she was face-to-face with me. She got right up in, I don't even know if you remember this, and you got right up in my face and said, Mitch, I'm praying you two apart. And, you know, I wasn't saved, y'all. I said, well, I hate your guts. Yeah, slap, slap. And she she said, well, I love yours. You're not going to hell. Then I started to say, and I didn't say it. Because I probably would have had to pick myself up off the floor. But you know what? We started having problems a couple of months later. I was no longer dating that girl. Thank God I'd already bought her a diamond. I was 17 years old and crazy. All right? Aren't you thankful for mothers? So, well, thank you, Mother. So when I think about the subject of hell, my mother literally prayed me out from the gates of hell. uh, And uh, I'm very thankful. Thank you, Mother, for praying. And and, uh, I'm one of her answered prayers. So we've been talking about this subject, and I think on on, uh, Mother's Day, but you know what? We need to hear this. And I was actually uh, up early this morning praying. And you know what I thought about about this subject? Most people don't think they're going. Most people don't think they need this subject. And even when I get up in a local church as a pastor and preaching on this subject, well, I don't need that. You know what? You need this more than you realize because the people around us are going there if we don't make if we don't share Jesus with them. How about that? And if you're here and you don't know Jesus and they've never been born again, that's a subject that you want to hear. But this morning, this morning, I was just thinking, you know, life happens so suddenly. And, and I remember, you know, July 20th, I mentioned 1975, I was 16, not quite 17, and had an uh, auto accident after a church service on a Sunday morning. And I had that girl my mother prayed me apart from in church with me. And, and we were on the back row, and uh, the uh, pastor gave an altar call and then uh, did not go because of her because I thought she would think I was nuts. And uh, how many know that's the wrong reason not to respond to God? And so we got out of church. You can set the clock by when we got out of church, 12 noon. And 12.05, I'm heading down the road past the college. I'm doing 55 because I just passed a car. And I had an accident at an intersection. When I had that accident, I hit a, Volks- a red Volkswagen Beetle with six guys in it, and it turned over on its side, and I jumped a ditch. My, my girlfriend, I mean, she almost went through the windshield. And uh, when I came to, she was in the floorboard. But during all that, the reason I said that was, when that happened, I don't know how the human brain works, but all I can tell you is my whole life flickered before me, just like that. Everything I'd ever done, everything I'd ever said, and I knew right at that moment I was not right for eternity. I thought that I was going to die and go to hell that day. And I'll never forget I came from the church I was in, and the pastor, one of the last things he said, you may never have another, another opportunity to get right with God, and he pointed his finger and said, you may go to hell today. The first thing, I saw all that stuff, and then I saw him pointing his finger. And then I noticed I wasn't dead yet. I want you to know life happens suddenly, y'all. You hear me? Uh, I was in another scrap in 2004. I was in my car going to church early one morning, and it had rained. I mean, not a slow rain. I mean, I mean a, a Noah, Noah Ark flood rain all night long. And man, you wake up and it's just pouring all night, just pouring. And I didn't realize that Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I lived, has flash floods. I get in my car to be at work early. I was going to get there about 5.30 or actually 5 o'clock. And, uh, and so I'm tooling down the road. And before you can say scat, I, I, I can't see my headlights because they're underwater. And I look to my left and water is all the way up to the rear view mirrors on my car. Ask me if I got scared. Well, I just said that to say I wasn't scared I was going to die and go to hell because I was going to heaven at that point. But I'm just saying life happens quickly. And if you're not right with God, how many know quickly comes quickly? And quickly comes unassumingly. 
and quickly comes when we least expect it. And I've had people over the years who, uh, who have told me, friends of mine, well, I'm not going to hell. I've got plenty of time. Some of them, I hate to tell you, I think just may be there because they planned on repenting, but they didn't have time because suddenly came. I'm going to know it's important to be ready. So I'm talking about the subject of hell because it's rarely mentioned today. It's something that we need to mention. Some portions of the church seem like, seem like they almost need to apologize for this blot on God's character that He created this place called hell. Well, hell, was, hell wasn't created for humans. Hell was created for Satan and his angels when they fell from heaven after Lucifer disobeyed God, if you read the Scripture. How many understand that? But why do men and women go to hell? Because there's no other place for them to go in the universe. Is we, if we die as eternal spirit beings made in the image of God who will never cease to exist, we die without Christ, we die without the new birth, there has to be somewhere in eternity for us to go. There has to be. Or otherwise, uh, you know, these, these, these deceitful, wicked personalities of ours would demoralize the entire universe. Think about criminals, the criminals of the ages that you've read about in history books. Think about them. Once they die, if they don't meet Christ, they go into eternity. Some people are wicked and they want to hurt people. What if that malevolent personality was allowed to, to just, uh, just roam about the universe at will, doing whatever that personality wanted to do? God could not have that. Wickedness can never enter into heaven. God is holy. People don't realize that today. He's more than just a Santa Claus in the sky. No, he's a holy being who loves us so much that once we sinned, he knew there was a huge problem. He knew once we sinned, we couldn't go to heaven. He had to do something else. So he had to allow us to go to that place not created for us because there was nowhere for us to go. But he loved us so much for God so loved the world. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, from heaven who had fellowship with him from eternity past. And Jesus came and lived in a human body just like we live in. Faced every temptation that we face. Goes through every grueling thing of life that we experience. Everything that we experience he experienced, Scripture says, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He, gave us, a, he made, gave us a moral compass. He showed us how to live the life, but he lived the life for us. And the really cool thing was, we'll find this out next week, Jesus literally lived to die. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy or undo the works of the devil. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life how many hear me and when Jesus died Jesus died in our stead in our place the soul that sins dies Jesus died not because he sinned but because he assumed our sin and when Jesus died paradise was not heaven paradise was the righteous side of hell we'll look at it next week Jesus went to hell for us and did the time that we should spend in hell for us paid the penalty of sin for us and then the Holy Spirit came on him and he was raised from the dead now how about you know how many know we owe a debt to Jesus because he gave his all for us he paid a debt he did not owe I owed a debt I could not pay. We used to sing the song in the 1970s. Thank God, how aren't you glad that someone paid your debt? It's appointed unto man wants to sin after that, uh, wants to die after that judgment. Thank God, Jesus incurred, incurred, incurred our judgment. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, how could a good God allow you? God doesn't allow us to go to hell. He lets us make a free will choice as to what we want to do with life. He's already made the way of escape, already paid the price to be free from it. If we go, anybody that goes, goes on their own, own accord because they were rebellious, stubborn, and chose hell over heaven. So I want to look at a scripture today, and let's move right through this, Luke 16. Now this is more than just a parable. Some people think this is allegorical, it's not true, it's not real, it never happened. But anywhere in the Bible where Jesus talked in parable form, he said it was a parable. He never said this was a parable. Luke 16, 19, Jesus said there was a certain rich man. A certain man. That means it's more than a parable. This really happened. 
And this is a story of a person who transitioned from this life, two people that transitioned from this life to the next. This was under the Old Testament era. It's during Jesus' time, or before Jesus' time. Jesus tells the story. There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who, who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was, who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried. Now it's interesting there, both of these men died. And I, I had the thought this morning, I wonder if that rich man was aware that his life would change suddenly. That's how sudden death comes. I've told you before, I've been near death six times. All of those six times, it wasn't something that I was expecting. When I did drugs, I, they laced my marijuana. I was smoking at age 14 with something. And when I lost my sight, I thought that moment I was going to die. I was having a wonderful party in time prior to that, laughing, cussing, joking with my friends. But just like that, my life changed. And friends, I was not ready. And uh, God, it scared literally the hell out of me. I thought that day I was going there. You know, if you have a near-death experience, what you know is it's really quick, it's really rapid. And that's the reason it's a dangerous thing to say, well, I don't plan on going to hell. I plan on making Jesus Lord. That's where a lot of people are today. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. This rich man, he was enjoying what he did. He enjoyed his life, he enjoyed his luxury, enjoyed his food, he enjoyed his clothes. He probably enjoyed everything that went around along with that during that era of time. But he wasn't prepared for what was about to happen. He died. In juxtaposition to that, here's the, here's the poor man. He had no clothes. He was haggard. He had nothing to eat. He was begging for food. And it seems like nobody was giving him anything to eat. And then he died. He wasn't prepared to die, but death came as a victory for him, as a joy for him. It led him out of some really uh, taxing and grueling circumstances. Nonetheless, both of them. Somebody said, death makes all men brothers. I don't care if you're rich. I don't care whether you're poor. I don't care if you got a trillion dollars, a billion dollars, a million, million dollars, or no dollars. I don't care if you live in the largest house in Raleigh. Or you live in a pup tent over here in the woods. When you die, everybody goes. And there's only two places to go. The thing that makes the difference, my friends, is the new birth. No, no, here it is. And so it says here, um, the rich man also died. Now, I want you to notice this. I'm going to give a little commentary as we go. Um, finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels. Everybody say carried by the angels. See, a believer See, obviously this poor man, even though Jesus hadn't come and paid the, 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 uh, the price for our sin, he evidently trusted the blood covenant. So he went to that righteous side of hell before Jesus died. And that tells you something. When a, when a believer dies, you never die alone. There's somebody with you. Even if the room is by, you're in, or by yourself in a room, the angels of God are there to carry you away. I remember when my father died, March six years ago in 2012, I, I put my hand on the back door, and my mother, uh, usually I had to ring a little bell, and but the door was ajar about six to eight inches, and I thought that's unusual. My dad was in the front of the house in a hospital bed, and we knew he, he was about to expire, and he wanted to go. He was ready to go. He had made his peace with God. I opened the door, and when I put my hand on the door, it's an unusual experience right here in my ear. I heard, I heard that death angel's here. I said, I mean, I looked. I looked around to see who's talking to me. I thought, that's odd. I went through the porch, went into the kitchen. Usually my mother's there, and she wasn't there to greet me. Usually she's there. She was in front of the house with my dad. And, um, and I went into the kitchen, and she come up to me and said, Miss, for the past three days, the death angel's been here. He's about to take your daddy away. She said to me. Now, how she knew that, I don't know. I guess the Lord spoke to her, I'm assuming. You remember saying that to me? And... Uh, but, but I just heard that independent of her. I thought, that's really something. Then I had a friend some years ago in 2007 that uh, went to heaven. He had an atheist brother. I've got to make the story real short. He had an atheist brother. All of his family was in the room with him. Uh, he was about to die. He was in a hospital bed in his living room. 
And uh, he had all the family, they were believers, except this one atheist brother. And just when he expired, early wee hours of the morning, when my friend expired, the a- atheist brother became animated and asked, asked the family friends, did y'all see that? Did y'all see that? They said, what are you talking about? He said, right when, when, uh, when he died, he said he saw his spirit, something get up, he saw him get up out of his body. And he said he saw this being with wings come down through the ceiling, grab him in his arms. And when he took him away, one of the wings of that being hit him on the shoulder. This was an atheist. Did it shock him? I mean, you don't even have to say, did it shock him? Bottom line is, if you're a believer and you die, you don't go alone. This rich man died and was buried and went to the place of the dead, the place of the the spirits of the departed dead, wicked dead. Then in torment, he was alone. He was by himself. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to tip the, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. Wow. What does that tell you about death? You don't cease to exist. You don't cease consciousness. Uh, in death, there are thoughts there are feelings. There is sensation. He, had, he wanted the tip of his tongue to keep from being parched. He had fingers. He could feel the flames were tormenting his personage. Even though he wasn't in a spiritual, a physical body, his spirit body was there in eternity. And his spirit body was just like his physical body. He talked about his tongue. He talked about Lazarus' finger. He talked about dipping his finger in water. See, what are you going to look like in eternity? Well, look in the mirror. Except all the blemishes, age, and perfections are gone. Is that cool? That's you in eternity. So go on. He goes on to say here, Um, The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. There are flames in hell. A lot of people say hell is just a figment of the imagination or, or hell is something that you create yourself. No, hell here is a place with flame. But Abraham said to him, Some remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus has nothing. Now he has been here... He... Now he is here being comforted and you're in anguish. And besides, uh, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over uh, to us from there. Prior to Jesus dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, Old Testament saints, and during that era of time, hell was divided into two compartments. You've heard me say that before. One was paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise or the righteous side of hell, or the Jews called it Abraham's bosom. And it was the righteous side of hell, those that were trusting the blood covenant sacrifices of animals to cleanse their sin once a year. They had a promissory note of salvation. Salvation wasn't, hadn't been delivered yet by the Lord Jesus, so they couldn't go to heaven because they're literally still sinners. They have not yet been born again. They believed in God. They believed the Messiah was coming. They believed those animal sacrifices pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. He just hadn't got there yet. So they stayed in paradise. And then the wicked dead went to the other place across a chasm to a, to a place of flame, a t- place of fire. Paradise no longer exists when Jesus rose from the dead. He cleaned paradise out. He took all of those Old Testament believers with him when he died. Matthew 27, 51, the graves in Jerusalem opened up. The saints appeared to many in Jerusalem. And when Jesus went up, they went up. They're in heaven now in glorified bodies. That is the first resurrection. But hell perhaps is expanded now because there's a lot more people that have died since that time, that era in the first century. Hell's expanded and, and hell is still a hot place and the wicked dead still go to that holding place called hell. And so he says, um, then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. I have five brothers and I want to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham. 
But if someone sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. How many know the wicked, the human heart is wicked? It's deceitful and it's hard. How many hear me? So that's a shocking story. Real quickly here, there are 11 things that the Bible says describes conditions in hell. Now, I don't have time to go over the scripture. They're in my notes online. I do encourage you to get my notes because I literally don't have time. All I'm going to do is read the headlines here that you've got that you have to fill in the blank. Uh, 11 things that describe hell. Number one, separation from God. Uh, Seth, Second Thessalonians 1, 9, they will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be alone constantly. Do you? And what about being alone from the presence of God? Doesn't just last for a moment or a day, it's eternity. Number two, hell is experiencing outer darkness. Matthew 22, then the king said to his aides, bind his hands, his feet, throw him into outer darkness where there's weeping, gnashing of teeth. Second Peter 2 mentions this darkness. They are doomed to the blackest darkness. I don't know about you, but I don't like the dark. I've been on missions trips in other parts of the world. You don't have wonderful electricity like I have here. It goes out. When it's out, it's dark. And there are critters in the room. And those critters are looking to get on you. And I don't like critters. You don't know it, but I travel with a little flashlight in my pocket because I don't like the dark. You know what? In hell, they don't give out any flashlights. You ever been to Linville Caverns or some of these caverns and they say, we'll cut the light off? It's dark. Think about eternal darkness number three unquenchable eternal and unquenchable fire jesus said it i mentioned a few weeks ago if your hand causes you to sin cut it off it's better to enter into eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands and if your foot causes you sin, cut it off. Better for you to enter life lame than have two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Number four, everlasting disgrace. Many of the bodies of uh, bodies, many of those whose bodies lie dead, Daniel 12, 2. And buried will rise up, speaking of the end of time. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting disgrace. It's one thing to be disgraced for a moment or a day, but for eternity... Lee it. Number five, everlasting torment. And they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will arise forever and ever. And they will have no relief day or night. Everlasting torment is ascribed to hell. Number six, eternal punishment. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire. In verse 46 of Matthew 25, they'll go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into everlasting life. Number seven, everlasting destruction. Second Thessalonians 1, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord. Philippians chapter 3, they're headed for destruction. Matthew 7, enter by the gate, narrow gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Romans 9, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction. Hell's talking about destruction. Destruction of, of all that is good, all that is beautiful, all that is fair, all that is right. All that is good, and it goes on in eternity. I don't like this one. Number eight, eternal maggots. Right causes you to sin, gouge it out. Better to enter into the kingdom with one eye than have two eyes to be thrown into hell where the maggots never die. I'm going to tell you, this is really gross. I was a little boy. My, I've never even told my mother this one. She let me go for a walk in the woods. I was about eight years old, and I, I took this left turn down a dirt road, and I was going around this corner into the forest, and I, saw, I heard something. I heard flies flying. Zzz. I looked over, and here's a dead bulldog, and guess what was seething in the... I won't even go there anymore. How would you like that for eternity, friend? Oh, it's bad, bad. The wrath of God is hell. Because you're stubborn, refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself for a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. 
And so again, he will pour out, verse 8, his anger and wrath, Romans 2. Uh, number 10, retribution, punishment proportionate to the evil a person does. Revelation 22, look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. So the punishment in hell is commensurate with the crimes committed. It's really interesting. Don't have time to go there. Then lastly, the second death. Then death and the grave are thrown into the lake of fire, and that is the eternal resting place, the Bible says, of the wicked dead. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, but the cowards, unbelievers, corrupt murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, all liars, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. None of that's pleasing. Nobody wants to hear that, but friends, it is the stark reality of human life, void of the new birth, void of a relationship with God, filled with stubborn, self-serving idolatry. And friends, the masses of people around us without Christ need to hear a place to avoid. I, I want to show you an 11-minute clip from Kenneth Hagin, this is 2003, six months later, he went into eternity himself. He's 85 years of age in the film you're about to see. He turned, uh, he turned 86 just a couple of months later. But I want you to hear, because Kenneth Hagin, when he was 16 years of age, he had a, 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 some physical problems, and bottom line, he died three times, and he did not know Christ. So here's a man... And, and I, I vouch for him because I know him to be a man of utmost integrity. It's one of the Bible schools I attended. But this is his personal experience of a person who died without Christ and who faced hell. Roll the clip and cut the lights off. At 7.30, Saturday night, 22nd day of April, 1933, just as Grand Paul's clock on the mantelpiece in this south bedroom struck 7.30, my heart stopped. Faster than I can tell you, I felt the circulation cut off way down at the end of my toes. In other words, my toes, my feet, my, my knees, my thighs just, just went numb. And I leaped out of my body like a diver would leap out of, oh, oh no, off of a diving boat into the swimming pool. And when I leaped out of my body, I began to descend, feet first, descend, go down, down. I looked back up, I could see the lights of the earth. Finally, they all vanished away. Darkness. The Bible talks about being cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Darkness encompassed me around about. Darker, darkness that's blacker than any night man's ever seen. Seemed if you'd had a knife, you could cut a chunk of it out. And so I went down through the darkness. And the further down you went, the, the hotter it got. And finally, way down beneath me, I could see fingers of light flickering on the wall of darkness. And I came to the bottom of the pit. And when I did, I saw the gates of hell. And I continued like a magnet pulls metal to itself. And I, I knew once I go through those gates, I can't come back. And, and so I tried to slow my descent down. And uh, there was a creature. I don't know what it looked like. I never did look at it. My gaze was riveted on the fires of hell, giant orange flames with a white crest. And, and so this creature took me by the arm, the right arm, to escort me in. And thank God when he did, there was a voice that spoke. I don't know what he said. It wasn't English. It wasn't English. I don't know what he said. But it's a man's voice. And when he spoke, that whole place shook just like there's an earthquake on. And there was an irresistible pull to my back, like a magnet draws metal. And I just began to float backwards. And then when I got back here, then I came up. I came up on the porch outside. We had one of those old-time houses, like they, you know, had the South and then Texas, a porch nearly all the way around the house. I came up on the porch on the south side of the house. I saw the giant trees in the yard. I came right through the wall. I saw my grandmother as she held me in her arms. I seemed to leap inside my body. When I got inside my body, then I said to my grandmother, I'm going again. I don't know how I knew that, but I said, I'm going again. And, and I said, uh, tell mama I said goodbye. I said, where's mama? 
And, and she said, well, I told her you was gone. I told her you was dead. And she rushed out on the porch of praying. I heard her then as she came around that porch to the south, praying at the top of her voice. And I said, well, and, and so I said, Granny said, I'll go get her. And Granny got up to go, and I said, no, 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 I'll tell you, when you get down to the end of it, you want somebody with you, especially if you're not saved. You want somebody. Thank God we have somebody. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. And so I said, uh, I, she started to go, and I, and, and I said, no, 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 don't, don't leave me. Don't leave me. And so she called out, but she, uh, and, and, but she couldn't make Mom hear because she is praying so loud. And so I said, you tell her. You tell her for me. Tell Mama I said goodbye. Tell Mama I said I love her. Tell Mama I said I appreciate her when my daddy left, trying to make a living for us four kids until finally her health failed. And uh, I said, uh, tell Mama that I said, if I've ever put a gray hair in her head or a wrinkle in her face, that I'm sorry. Amen. I said, Granny, I'm, go I'm going again. I knew I was. I said, uh, uh, Goodbye. I said, you've been a second mother to me. I went to live with my grandparents. Mama had complete mental, physical, nervous breakdown. And, and I went to live with my grandparents at when I was nine years of age. And my grandmother always said, kiss me right there, kiss me right there. So I kissed her on the cheek, and my heart stopped. And the circulation cut out, down to the end of my toes. And, and, and when it hit me here, I leaped out of my body. And when I leaped out of my body, I had exactly the same experience. I began to descend down, 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 down. I know it's only a few seconds or moments, but it seemed like an eternity nearly. Till finally the darkness encompassed me. The dark, and it, the further down you went, the darker and the hotter it became. Finally I could see the f f lights flickering on the wall of darkness. I came to the, the bottom of the pit. I saw the gates of hell. I gazed into hell itself, and I said, uh, and I tried to slow down my descent, and I did slow it down some, but the creature of some kind, I don't know, years later or sometime later, I read in the Bible where it said, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Isaiah said that. Well, I saw that. Hell from beneath was moved to meet me at my coming. And so that creature took me by this arm, right arm, to escort me in. I'll talk more about that later. And so when he did, though, thank God, that voice spoke. I don't know what he said. It was a foreign tongue to me. But whatever he said worked. That creature took his hand off my arm. And like an irresistible pull, I just came floating back floating back and then I began to come up and I came up the first time on the porch just outside the south bedroom the second time I came up at the foot of the bed I saw my body lying there on the bed I saw my grandmother she held me in her arms I seemed to leap from the foot of the bed inside my body like a man would slip his foot inside of his boot in the morning time and then I said to granny you know, we sit out in the world. We said the third time's charm. I said, I'm going again. The third time charm, I won't be back. She said, I thought you wasn't coming back that time, son. And so I left a word for him. I said, tell Grandpa. I appreciate him giving me a home when I had none. Tell Grandpa goodbye. Tell my, I left a word for my older sister, my older brother, and my younger brother. And my heart stopped. And I leaped out of my body. And I began to descend down, 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 till the darkness encompassed me round about. Darkness is so dense you couldn't see your hand if it's one inch in front of your eye. And so, up till now, some way or another, I, f I didn't realize this is real. I thought I, this is uh, an hallucination. And so, I knew, you know, in the world we say the third time's charm. And I'd said to Grandma, I won't be back this time. And, other, and so in the darkness, in the darkness, I, I literally screamed. If I could do it like I did it, I'd almost scare you out of your wits. But I literally screamed, God, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. I'm trying to tell him I'm going the wrong direction. 
Amen. I shouldn't be. And, and I was scared because I thought I'm not coming back this time. And I've already got a glimpse of hell or what it looked like. And so I said, there's no answer. Only the echo of my own voice in the darkness. You ever been in a cavern like Carlsbad Cavern, for instance? I've been there. And you cry out, you know, and your voice will echo across the chasm. My voice only came back to echo me. God, God, I've been baptized in water. And so the second time I cried a little louder. God, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. No answer, only my own voice. Third time I literally scream, God, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. And I came to the bottom of the pit. I gazed through the gates of hell. They pulled me. I'm floating that direction. That creature took me by the arm to escort me in. But thank God. That creature took me by the arm the third time to escort me through those gates. I was going to put up a fight if I could. But thanks be unto God. That voice spoke. I don't know what he said. It's a foreign language to me. But whatever he said, I'd say maybe he spoke 10 or 12 words. But whatever he said, that creature took his hand off my arm. And there was an irresistible pull, like a metal draws, like a magnet draws metal to itself, to my back. And I came, come floating back, like you'd float in the air, you know. In other words, whole lot like those astronauts walking in space. And then, when I got back here, then up. And I was about, came right back through the darkness again before you get, began to see the lights. So before I could ever see the lights of the earth, I began to pray. See, the inward man's a real man. Amen. The spirit man. I began to pray and, and ask God to forgive me and ask God to save me. And I came up beside the bed. The only difference between all three experiences. Once I came up at, on the porch. Other time I came up at the foot of the bed. And this time I came up right beside the bed. Leaped inside my body. I got inside my body. My physical voice picked up my prayer light right in the middle of a sentence. But they tell me that me and mama prayed so loud that we blocked the traffic two blocks away. Just piled up. But folks, I guess, thought somebody dying. Well, it was. Amen. <laughs> Mama praying at the top of her voice. And I'll tell you, I prayed. Somebody said, I don't believe in loud praying. Well, I'm sort of a conservative person myself. But I'll tell you, I prayed out loud. Amen. Amen. 